Good to have everyone here. I know it's a beautiful day, and you could be doing a lot of other things, but you chose to come here, so I appreciate it. Um, excited about jumping in. Um, we're going to try to finish chapter 10 today. Um, I'm at, uh, next week is prayer, just so you know. We're, we won't be doing Bible study. It's, it's prayer. Uh, our, every fourth Wednesday of the month, we go into prayer for the, for the church, so I encourage you, people online, uh, people here, come on what next Wednesday night and, and pray with us. Um, the following week, um, I'm actually going to be on vacation and I'm going to have a uh, stand-in teacher. We're going to have Bible study, but it's going to be someone different. Um, and yeah, so we're, we're going to Nashville to, uh, my, for my son to look at some colleges and for us to visit a friend of mine who I discipled at West Virginia University. He's actually in the Christian music business. So he's going to show Zeke around in some recording studios and, and spoil us on his, uh, his parents. Actually, they're from Ohio. His parents actually moved to Nashville and bought a Longhorn uh, farm. So, yeah, cattle and stuff like that. So Janine's excited about that. And so, is, you know, so we're, we're all excited about that. I'm looking forward to seeing those guys. If, you, if you're friends with me on Facebook, I share, he does a Tuesday night lights or light Tuesday night lights I think it's what it's called and it's a it's a just a quick bible study and he writes songs to scriptures and uh, he shares them so if you're friends with me on Facebook you can find him his name's Kyle Thomas uh his actually his real name is Ty, Kyle Meinrich but when he went into the music business they were like yeah you got to get rid of the Meinrich that's not gonna work <laughs> so his middle name is Thomas so he goes by Kyle Thomas uh, really good music good stuff his last one was awesome Talking about his heart and, and giving his life to the Lord. So, uh, other announcements? Any other announcements going on? Uh, don't forget summer's best two weeks, you kids out there. Uh, end of July, beginning of August, we have two sessions. Uh, if anyone wants to volunteer, we still need volunteers. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think of anything else. We have a what is the annual or our annual meeting happen on January sixth for members? June 6th. What did I say? I always say January when I'm talking about June. You know what I'm talking about. The J one that's coming up, June. June 6th. Um, that should be good, even though I've never experienced one of those before. So that should be fun. Um, <laughs> people are laughing at that. I don't know what that means. <laughs> um, so anyways. All right. Anything else that I'm missing? Well, good. Let's... Uh, Let's jump in. Do we pray yet? Yeah, we need to pray first before we jump in. Father, we thank you so much for tonight. Lord Jesus, we have to come before you, Lord, because without you, we're nothing. Without you, this is all useless. But with you, Lord, um, you not only teach us through your word, through your spirit, but Lord, you help us understand what you're calling each of us. Lord, you may call us all a different way, but there's only one truth. But some of us get to that truth in different ways. And Lord, I pray that tonight we will find that truth and we'll realize what you're calling us to, and that is to believe. Lord, these, these religious leaders are coming after Jesus, and all he says, if you would just believe, you would understand, and you would be one of his children. You would be one of his sheep. You would hear his voice. And Lord, I pray today that if there's anyone here, Lord, that uh, is either listening online or here with us, Lord, and, and just, uh, Lord, they've never accepted you as their Lord and Savior, never started that relationship with the great shepherd. Lord, I pray tonight would be the, the night of salvation. And Lord, that we would continue to see people come to the saving knowledge of you because of what you are doing uh, in our lives. And Lord, through your word, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, we're jumping in. Uh, we are, we just, last week we talked about the good shepherd um, the Pharisee, the religious leaders are still coming at him, uh, like they do the entire time. Um, but we're going to start down all the way down in, uh, we're in chapter 10, starting in verse 22. And we're going to read through and a couple of these things that we're going to see. I'm actually, I have a few things I want to go through, uh, some other, some extra scriptures, but, um, it's just interesting that these guys keep asking the same question and, and it, it's like, I don't know how else to tell you, but two plus two equals four. I, I don't know how else to show it to you. I don't know if we can do it in a, in, you know, in any other way, but two plus two equals four. Jesus told him he's God. 
He's saying I am. He's telling that he is the Messiah. He's telling that he is the one that Moses talked about him, that Abraham talked about him. He's going back and forth. And when he's saying what he's saying, he's saying I'm God. And every time they pick up stones to kill him, it's because he's blaspheming. He's saying he's God. But yet they're still asking, okay, so tell us clearly, not really sure. What exactly are you trying to tell us? Like, it's crazy, but I think we do this in our own lives, right? We know what the truth is. We know the word of God is what we need, but yet we turn to other things. So let's jump in. Verse 22 of of John chapter 10. It says, at that time, the feast of dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. I mean, seriously, it's like, guys, I don't know how else you're going to hear this. You know, we're trying to get it across to you. He's healing people. He's doing things. They've tried to lay hands on him before, but he's disappeared and he's still. And guys, there's people in our world that really are here. They're, They're so blinded by their life, by what they want, that they're not listening to the truth. We've got to be careful of doing that ourselves. You ever, you ever had anyone, and I've, I've had this experience, have you ever been caught in sin and, I mean, maybe not something horrific, but it's sin and, and all the matter, right? And someone points it out to you and you don't want to hear them. And they point it out to you again and you don't want to hear them. And then all of a sudden something happens and it's like the light comes on and that person looks at you like, I've, I've told you this. You weren't listening to me. And sometimes it takes that that person to share it over and over again. Maybe it takes another person to share it. I don't know, but these people are not listening. This is Jesus. This is God himself sharing with them who he is and they're not getting it. Okay. So you got to understand that it's, it's, it's shocking to us that other people don't get it, but these people are literally with the one and they're not understanding it. Right. So the feast, feast of dedications, which we've actually gone over this before, but just, to, just to kind of give you a, a little bit of a A background on this, the Feast of Dedication, this feast is also known as Hanukkah, celebrated the cleansing and rededication of the temple after three years of desecration by Antiochus Epiphanes, king of Syria in 164 or 165 BC. After Antiochus attacked Jerusalem, he instituted a reign of terror upon the Jews of the city uh, and Antiochus stole millions of gold and silver from the temple He said that possessing a copy of the law was punishable by death. Was it last week that we talked about the Bible being illegal? Uh, I I don't know if it was with this group. I do so many Bible studies, sometimes I forget who I'm talking to. Uh, But yeah, you you know, it's funny. Even all the way back then, you know, you look at the law, the word of God was, was, was punishable by death. And yet today we still have that. The Bible's illegal in so many countries. Um, It's just... I don't know, it's just crazy. The, the enemy is still using the same tactics today that he used, you know, so many thousands of years ago. Anti, uh, he said that uh, c- circumcising a child was punishable by death. Why is that bad? Because that was what the Jewish people were told to do after eight days, right? To circumcise their children, right? He, they were told not to do that. They couldn't do that. It was, you would be dead by, you know, doing that. Mothers who did circumcise their children would be crucified with their children hanging around their necks. That's exactly what these type of people did. That's what these leaders did. It wasn't some like, no, you're just bad. They they punished to the utmost. Uh, The temple was turned into a house of prostitution. Uh, The great altar of burnt offering was turned into an altar unto the Greek god Zeus. Pigs were sacrificed upon the great altar. And again, we know that's bad because the the Jews were not allowed to even touch pork at all. And so you can see where the temple was desecrated. Okay, so now you know why this is such an important holiday. They celebrated this. When the the temple came back and and it was was cleansed, that's why they still celebrate this today. Well, just so you know, Jesus... He did celebrate these Jewish holidays. He was in the temple. Everywhere he went, he went to the temple. The one thing that is interesting that we do see as you look at the life of Jesus 
Yes, he was trying to bring a new covenant. It was the covenant of Christ, the covenant of love, the covenant of his blood. But he didn't shun the Jewish traditions. He actually walked in them. And I think that's interesting. I think so many times what we think in church, and and I'm going to tell you, I've said these things at times. I do think church becomes such a religious thing that it's so, it pushes so many people away. But listen, there's still an obedience of coming together. There's still an obedience of, of the, of the gospel of, of coming together as one to encourage each other, to walk with each other. Right. I got a question. How many times does it say go to church in the new Testament? Doesn't actually. But what do we know of the what do we know of the of the law, right? Jesus came to what? To get rid of the law? No, to fulfill the law. So what's that? Right. I was just gonna you're jumping ahead, Joy. Yeah, absolutely. And and Hebrews, right? Hebrews, uh that's Hebrews thirteen, is it not? I think it is. It says, Do not forsake forsake the coming together of the brethren, but that's really the only place. Yeah, it doesn't say go to church, but what's crazy is I got to be honest with you guys. I think we still, we, we hold a little bit of that Old Testament honoring the Sabbath and, and that religious thing about going to church in our culture. You know, ask a lot of people, you ask people, you'll never hear someone go, I got to go less to church. Whenever you talk to someone about being a pastor, the first thing they'll tell you is, yeah, I know I got to get back to church. I didn't even ask you about church. That's why on Saturday, I was talking to some people at the engine show that let, I did everything I could not to tell them I was a pastor of this church. I was talking to this one guy, and he's like telling me about his motorcycle, and he's, you know, using things, you know, you know, using some language, and I'm just listening to him. I'm like, he had a beautiful motorcycle. And so I asked him what he did, and he told me, and then he asked me what I did. I said, well, I'm on staff here. And I was hoping he'd just leave it at that, but no, he didn't do that. I am on staff here, but he's like, so what do you do there? I'm like, I'm a pastor. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm like, that's why I didn't want to tell you what I do. Like, I appreciate the respect, but you know, like, and then his whole conversation changed and I lost him. I'm like, uh, I'm a pastor and I'm still a guy. I want to have a conversation about your motorcycle. We still talk. And he lied. It was gone. He couldn't talk to me anymore. So I still loved on him a little bit. And, and, you know, it was good. Like he was a good guy. Um, he needed Jesus, and I, I told him. I invited him to come. I invited a lot of people. You know, there was three people that I met on Saturday didn't know this was a church. They thought it was a school, which it is a school. They did not know this was still a church. Is that not cra- yeah. crazy? Apparently, it doesn't stand out other than those gold letters that says Lima Christian School. I guess that, I don't know what it is. They did not know this was still a church. That's a problem, and I'm going to tell you, part of that is our problem, okay? But that was great because I got to tell them, oh, yeah, it's a church. You got to come. I don't know if they came on Sunday. I know we had more people on Sunday than we had Easter service, so that was pretty cool. But back to this. So the Feast of Dedication, Antiochus was a horrible leader. He, he desecrated the temple. We see that. Then the rise of the Maccabees ended these horrors. It was told that when the temple had been purified and great seven-branched candlestick relit, only one little uh, cruise of unpolluted oil could be found. The cruise was still intact and still sealed with the impress of the ring of the high priest. There was only one. By all normal measures, there there was only oil enough in the cruise to light the lamps for one single day. But by a miracle, it lasted for eight days until new oil had been prepared according to the correct formula and had been consecrated for its sacred use. That's a kind of cool story, I think. God, it was there. They wanted to have the temple. They wanted to light the oil. They wanted to have the light of God in their temple. They only had enough for a day, and God let it last eight days until they could have other oils prepared. Pretty neat stuff. So what else sticks out in these first few ver- few verses that we see? We only read a couple from verse 22 to 20. Really, it's just two of them, right? Three of them. I think a couple of things in this. Jews gathered around him. Okay, when they gathered around him, basically what they did was they circled him. 
They, they held him there. They, they wanted to make sure that he couldn't go away. The confrontation between Jesus and the religious leaders in the temple courts, however, Jesus does not seem to teach when this confrontation began. And, and he, wasn't a, he wasn't worried. He wasn't about the confrontation. He wasn't like that wasn't the focus of this. But they circled. Have I ever told you guys a story about this happening to me? Not in the Jewish temple, all right, because that's, that's not around right now. But it happened in a church in Tennessee. Have I ever tell you guys a story? So I'm in a church in Tennessee, and I didn't realize what KJV only meant. In, in, in the southern states, not every church, but almost every church that has KJV only, it actually is a racist church. And we're in this church, and my wife's there, and uh, the pastor starts teaching. He's teaching on Galatians, where there's no Jew, nor Greek, nor male, nor female, nor slave, nor free, but we're all one in Christ. He said, right after he reads that scripture, he said, but that doesn't break all racial barriers. We are black, tan, white, and red, and we need to stay that way. God does not want us to mix race. My wife literally was holding my hand and almost broke my hand. She was so angry. I said, honey, relax. We're not going to do this right in the middle of the service. I'll take care of this afterwards. So we get done with the service. I walked up to him very gently, and I said, sir, you know, good to meet you. I, I just have something to share. I said, you, you shared this out of, from your pulpit. And I said, I got to be honest with you, that scripture is actually teaching exactly opposite of what you said. It's saying that we're all one in Christ. It really doesn't matter. And I don't know if he pushed a button. I don't know if he, like, said something. But the deacons of the church, literally, there was like 10 of them. They came up front and they circled us. And they started mocking me with Old Testament scriptures. And they started mocking me with the, the way I, I believed. They were literally mocking me. And I kept just, in a very humble manner, I kept sharing scripture and saying, guys, you're wrong. The thing is, we got to realize is that I said, I said, who was Moses married to? Do you guys know who Moses was married to? She was an Ethiopian woman. Okay, what color is an Ethiopian woman? She's black, okay? And you know what the pastor said to me? I don't use that one. I said, of course you don't. You can't. There's no way you can. I said, you, you guys are not teaching correct theology in this church. And they just, I'm serious, this lasted probably a good 30 minutes. And they were just, I thought I was going to be beaten up. I did. I didn't know what was going to happen, but I kept calm. I kept cool. And I just, I just shared scripture and shared the gospel. I said, guys, you need the gospel of Jesus Christ. I said, cause your gospel is not of Jesus Christ. It's of racism. And God is not about racism. And I'll not, I mean, I know it was a, one of the scariest things, right? But God gave me strength. And it was so crazy as they had nothing because I didn't get angry because I didn't come back at them with anger. I just spoke truth. They had nothing to come against me. And God protected me that day. And the pastor just got mad at me. And he goes, I got to lock up. And he walked out. The only person they tell you not to marry is a... Non non correct. Do not be... Un well, and it's talking about unequally yoked. With that, with that scripture, Mary is saying the only person that says not to marry is an unbeliever. And someone outside our belief of Christ, of Jesus Christ. I want you to understand that was what that's talking about, but it's not just talking about marriage. That's actually talking about relationships. It, you could take that as in a business relationships. You could talk about uh, really best friends. It's good to have friends that are non-believers. I have a lot of friends that are non-believers, but I'm not yoked with them. And so I tell you that story because it's kind of like this, going back to the scripture. Jesus, uh, the Jews gathered around him and said, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus, in verse 25, answered them, I told you, and you do not believe the works that I do in my, father, in my Father's name bear witness about me. Well, just in case you don't remember, I actually printed out all the times that he told them who he was. Okay? So bear with me. If you want this document, I can email it to you. Um, I can make copies tonight if you want to bring it home. I have... It's not all of them, but it's the majority of them, all right? John 3.13 and John 6.38, it says, I am the one who came from heaven. John 3.15 said, I told you, whoever believes on me has eternal life. John 5.19 through 23, I told you, I am the unique son of God. That's pretty clear, right? 
John 5, 19 through 23, I will judge all humanity. That's God, right? John 5, 19 through 23, I told you all should honor me just as the honor, just as the honor God, as, as they honor God the Father. Okay? John 5, 39, the Hebrew scriptures all speak of me, Jesus said. John 7, 28 to 29, I perfectly reveal God the Father. Okay? Again, just in case you didn't read chapter 10, it says, can you plainly tell us? John 8, 29, 8, 46, I always please God and never sin. That's pretty clear. There's only one that doesn't sin. That's God, right? We know that. John 8, 42, I am uniquely sent from God. John 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am. Again, very plainly. John 9, 37, I am the son of man prophesied by Daniel. <laughs> just throwing in some Old Testament stuff just in case you guys don't understand what I'm saying, okay? I will raise myself from the dead. John 10, 17 through 18. John 6, 48, I am the bread of life. John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. John 10, 9, I am the door. We just read that last week. And John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. And what do they say after this? After all these things, they say, tell us plainly. Okay? As you can tell, Jesus has been telling them plainly. What do you guys think they're missing? Why are they missing this? Tradition, okay, I'll give you that one very clearly, yes. What else? Jealousy, Jealousy? okay, yeah, because Jesus was changing the way he was, they did it, right? Go ahead. Yeah, he said, you're gonna, I'm going to blind your eyes. In, in fact, right before we, we, we talked about this, actually earlier in chapter 10, it says, for this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. And then verse 19, there was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, uh, these are not the words of, the, of those. Um, this isn't actually what I wanted to read. It's actually back in ver, uh, chapter nine. And he talks about at the end of chapter nine, he says, Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, we see your guilt remains. And because they think, that they can see, but yet they're blind, right? Yes. Yeah, those people that circled around me, they thought they were right too, right? But very clearly, because what their message was, and guys, I want to tell you, the message that these religious leaders were bringing was hatred. It was anger. It was division. And I'm going to tell you, even if, let's say, let's say I... I don't know. Let's say there is a sin in my life and you come to me. Even the way you say it, you got to be careful. Do you know what I mean? It's God said, Jesus said these things in humility, even though he said it in direct truth and probably stepped on their toes a lot when he said, you don't believe. He's going to say it again later on in this chapter. He's saying, you don't believe me. Therefore, you don't believe the father. You're not with the father. You're not, you don't know God. So all these things are missing. The other one is the Holy Spirit. They haven't, allowed the, they haven't allowed God to open their eyes. They've tried so hard to get it all right. They got it all figured out, right? And right when you think you got it all figured out, you're wrong. Now, now listen, think about that in anything of life. Have you ever met a leader, a CEO? Have you ever met someone that thinks they know everything? Do they got it figured out? Is it, does it work out for them? Not in the long run. They're stressed out. They, they, you know, they don't trust anybody. And, and, and you think about that, guys. We can never have that heart, especially as Christians. We got to think about that. These guys are missing it. It's so clear. We just went through all the, all the gospel of John. Then verse 25, Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe the works that I do in my father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. Here he goes. He tells him before, I'm the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice. And then he talks about he's God, right? He's saying, you're not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. 
I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. What's, what's sticking out there, guys? No one will snatch them out of my hand. It's pretty reassuring. Yeah, I would say. Are there any scriptures that come to mind when you hear that? Anything come to, come to mind? What's that? Eternal security. Yes, absolutely. What? What? Else? Is there any other scriptures that come to mind? I know from. What's that? Uh, well, you have, are you talking about where it says, uh, I write these things so you can know that you have eternal life. That's John, uh, first John chapter five. Uh, and it literally says, I write these things so you can know you have eternal life. How about Romans eight, Romans eight at the end of Romans eight. Let's go there real quick. This is it, right? Can't snatch them. Let's starting in verse uh, eight, verse 31. What then shall we say these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it? Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is the right hand of God and indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers nor height, nor depth, nor any else in all creation will able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I mean, come on. How does that not fire us up? How does that not get us excited? How does that not get us like, what? Nobody's going to snatch them out of my hand. God, nothing can separate me from God's love. You know why? Because it's called unconditional love. It's the agape love, right? Guys, I want to tell you something. That is amazing right there. Go back to the Gospel of John. So he says in verse 26, But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I am the Father are one. Should this not be encouraging? You know what I mean? I mean, think about this. If you're listening to this, you're thinking, no one talks like this. Even the religious leaders are thinking this. This should be exciting. They're saying, wait a second. I have an opportunity to have eternal life and know that I have eternal life. I have an opportunity to be in God's family. And yeah, we know the Messiah is coming. This guy is talking just like the Old Testament. We're hearing it over and over again of things that we have memorized. Right? That's what Jesus is doing. He's fulfilling all of these things. You would think they'd be pretty excited about it, right? One of the things I think about when I see he knows his sheep is a let go and let God be the judge to lose. As someone we know maybe who professes to be a Christian and just struggles, 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 and what we see is that they're always getting themselves out of the bin. You know, yeah. Yeah. Guys online, Joy just said a whole bunch that you just missed out on. And I'm going to tell you basically what she said is, if you're struggling and you're continuing to struggle, let go and let God. If you are his child, stop trying to figure it out and trust in the King of Kings. That's where the faith comes in, right? That's where the belief, but those that try on their own, they are in a cycle of sin over and over. They get out of this, they go back into this, right? We see it. And I have people come to me, how do I get out of it? And I tell them, basically, trust Jesus, trust God, believe. Yes, 
Go to the word of God. Let it be the thing that transforms you. Let the Holy Spirit come in. But guess what? It, there's where you go all the way through the scriptures, guys. Sometimes you just have to be obedient. And Trust God and leave the consequences to him is something that Charles Stanley always says. Yes, absolutely. And so we see these things, guys. And, and what it is, is, is if, if God is there for us, and no one can go against us. Does it not give you a confidence to know that it's going to work out? I don't know how. I really don't. It might be your death. And he might kill you to save you from something worse. That's actually part of scripture. I know we always want to heal everybody, but guys, guess what? Some people just need to go home with Jesus, right? Now, I'm not saying we should pray for everyone to die, but I am, you know, I am saying like, we got to realize that death is a good thing. Paul says to live is Christ, to die is, oh, I don't want to. No, to die is gain is literally what it says, right? So I'm not saying let's try to die, but what I am saying is, like, guys, I want to tell you, we, we can't hold on to this life. That's what, Jesus is, that's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying that he's got you in control. Verse 29, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Again, he's claiming to be God. Let's see what happens next. Let's, let's jump in. Let's see what happens next. The Jews were so excited and they just gave their life to the Lord. No, that's not what it says. The Jews picked up stones against, again, again, by the way. <laughs> not the first, again, to stone him. Jesus answered them. I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Well, let me just get rid of this one little claim that a lot of non, non-Christians will say is that Jesus never claimed to be God. There's a lot of, there's a lot of people out there, a lot of religions say Jesus never claimed to be God. Do I need to go back over uh, all just in John alone, what we just went through, right? And do, how about this, right here? The, why would the Jews kill him then? They had no other reason to kill him. He didn't do anything else wrong, not unto death, but blasphemy, they had a right to stone somebody, right? And that's where we've got ourselves. They are, if he didn't claim to be God, they wouldn't have been trying to stone him, okay? That's understanding. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said, you are God, uh, you are gods. That's out of Psalm 82, six in a couple of different places. If, if he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the father consecrated and sent into the world? You are blaspheming because I said, I am the son of God. So back in the old Testament, the prophets, those that had God's word were called small gods, and it's because they basically were speaking words of life and death. And because they were speaking those words of life and death, they were called small gods. And, and actually, in, in Psalms, we see that. And it's not saying that they were God, but they were like gods, is basically what it's saying. Again, because they were bringing words of life and death. And what he's saying is, you guys even said that to different people. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just telling you what I am. I'm not I'm not trying to deceive you. I'm telling you what I am. And then he says, I am the son of God. If I am not doing the works of my father, then do not believe me. I love that. Basically, he's saying, watch me. See what I've done. What have I done that really is going to, I'm just, I'm, I'm healing people. I'm leading people to the father. Guys, I want to tell you this. We cannot look at other churches or other Christians and say they're not doing it right because they're not doing it our way. Now, that doesn't mean we can't see if they're teaching false doctrine, but if they're teaching Christ. You remember at one point they came to Paul and they said, all these guys are teaching all these things. They're doing it all these different ways and they're doing it in different... What did Paul say? Stop them all. Is that what Paul said? What did he say? He basically said, are they teaching Christ? I mean, he didn't say it like I would have said. I would have said, who cares? <laughs> They're teaching Christ, right? Now, we got to be careful with that because that, actually, actually, you know, that can get out of hand at, at times. And we got to make sure doctrine is, is important, right? 
But guys, I want to tell you, if they're leading people to Jesus Christ and people are coming to Christ, praise God. And that's where, where he's saying, if you, if you don't think I'm God, then just watch me. Watch me, right? That's why I, I, I like people being in our home. You know, I like the kids coming to our house. I like, you know, I always tell the kids, you're always welcome in our house. Why? Because we're perfect? No, but because we're trying to live for Jesus, even in our imperfections, Right? And, and we've got to live with each other, right? Acts 2.42, they came together, they got in the apostles' teaching, they got into prayer, they got into eating together or breaking bread, which some people say that's the Lord's Supper. I tend to actually disagree, but that's okay. If you want to say it's the Lord's Supper, fine. I just think they ate together. That's my opinion, but whatever. And they fellowshiped. They koinonia You know what koinonia means? They got together, they hung out. I don't know if koinonia is a, a Greek word, but it's koinonia, and they, they were in each other's lives. And I got to be honest with you, this church needs to do that more. We got to just stop coming to meetings and getting out of here. We got to be in each other's lives, man. We do. We got to play golf together because I like golf. We got to ride motorcycles together because I like motorcycles. We got to eat breakfast together because I like Western omelets. We got we to gotta be around each other so we can know what each other's needs are and, and how we can love on each other and be there for each other, right? Go ahead, Harry. Uh, two, walkers two walkers on Emmaus Road, yeah. Yeah, this was, and this was after his resurrection. They're on the road to Emmaus, and these two guys have no idea who he is. They hung out. They're eating a meal together, right? And until he broke the bread, they had no idea who he was. To me, that shows that you're allowed to hang out with people and just be you. And if you have the opportunity to share the gospel, share the gospel. Don't go with an agenda. Just be you. The Lord will give you opportunities to share the gospel. He will. And, and that's the things that are happening here, guys. I love this. He's saying, come watch me. He says, you know, let's go back to uh, 36. Do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? Um, let's go. I want to go to a couple of scriptures here off of this. Um, let's go to uh, Galatians 6, 9 through 10. And if anyone, guys, if you have any scriptures you want to share, you want to, you know, add to this, I can read them online so that people online can hear. But I would encourage you. That's why I tell you to read ahead, look at this stuff. If you got a Greek word you want to throw in there, you want to get into some crazy stuff, whatever. Let's get into it, man. I, I really love that stuff. All right. Colossians chapter or Galatians. I say Colossians. I meant, I'm looking at Colossians. Galatians chapter six. Starting in verse 9. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. See with what large letters I am writing. He's, he's basically saying that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm writing this, and this is where the, the scholars actually believe that Paul had something going on in his eyes even after he had those scales fall from his eyes. Remember he went blind, and then he got prayed for, and the scales fell off? Uh, they, he, they think he still had something. That was his thorn in his flesh. There was something going on in his eyes. It is In verse 12, it is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised or to do some religious thing and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised, that they may boast in your flesh. But far from it from me to boast, except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. And guys, what he's saying is basically let Christ be what you are about. Don't stop doing good. Don't grow weary of doing good. Don't let the religious things creep in and keep you from doing what God has called us to do, right? And sometimes it's just to serve each other. Sometimes it's just to help someone in time of need. Sometimes it's just to listen, right? And that's what Jesus is saying. 
He's saying, go ahead. I'm, I'm doing the work of the Father. Go back to the uh, Gospel of John, chapter 10. A couple of a couple other scriptures, actually, we're going to... I'm sorry, I wanted to share these, and I, I, I think we got some time. So let's go to Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 8. Verse 35, keep going to Isaiah, verse, uh, verse 40, uh, or chapter 40, verse 8. Where he says, if he called them gods in, verse, uh, in chapter 10 of John, I'm just going to read this. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be broken. I want, I want to show you a couple of scriptures on that. Go to Isaiah 40 verse 8. If I can find it, there it is. <clears throat> and it, oh, I, come on now. Why is this page not opening for me? There it is. All right. Newer, still a newer Bible. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. And what, John, what, what Jesus is telling them in Scripture cannot be broken. If he called the gods to whom the word of God came, in Scripture cannot be broken. He's talking about Old Testament, and he's saying God's word will never be broken. Then he says to them, come follow me because I am God. I am the Messiah. And the Old Testament prophecies will not be broken by me. If you want to know that I'm the Messiah, just watch what I do. I'm going to fulfill Old Testament. And what we see in Isaiah, we're also going to see it in Peter. Go all the way to the New Testament. First Peter, all right? Go all the way, and we're going to see it again. The Word of God. I want to tell you, if you want to know, some people say the Word of God is not actually God's Word. Well, you got to look at what the Bible says about itself. Very clearly, it calls itself God's Word. Many different places, all right? We're going to start in, uh, we're in First Peter we're going to be in uh, chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 22. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. Okay, it's amazing. That's actually talking about what John's talking about, right? That no one can snatch you out of God's hand. Verse 24, for all flesh is like grass and all its glory, like the flowers of the grass, the grass withers and the flowers fails, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is good news and was preached to you. His word is going to last forever, right? And guys, I want to tell you, if we are in God and we are doing God's work, God's word will be revealed in how we live. Go to First Corinthians. We're not going to turn there, but you guys know First Corinthians thirteen, the chapter of what? Love. Who is God? Love. We see that it is by His love. We read in Romans chapter eight, right? That nothing can separate us by His love. We'll go to the chapter of love and look at what love is. I'm going to tell you. It says one thing: love never fails. I'm sick and tired. I'm, I'm sorry. I love you guys, and I love all the people that are going through this, but I'm sick and tired of hearing I just don't love them anymore. That's not true love, guys. It's not true love. That's not, love isn't a feeling. There are feelings involved. Don't get me wrong. A lot of them, right? But love, are, love cannot be based on a feeling. It's got to be based on what? The truth. A choice. And that's what he's saying, okay? So we see that. Love, right? We, guys, I want to tell you, it's all over the scriptures. Man, I just... It kills me that we have a breakdown of what the Word of God says. The Word of God is true, and the Word of God never fails. Go back to the Gospel of John chapter 10. Anybody have anything to say? I've been talking a lot. A lot in here. All right, let's keep going. Remember, you're always welcome to cut me off. What's that? Yeah, you can try. I mean, just speak up. Don't be afraid. Speak up. I might speak louder, but no, I'm just kidding. Well, one thing you said about um, the pastor who said we don't do that verse. I was talking one time to a Jehovah's Witness, and using the scriptures that said um, Jesus sat on the Son of God. Yeah. And that's the answer they gave to me. Yeah, we don't use that one. <laughs> yeah, Joy was talking about, for those online, that she was talking to Jehovah's Witness, and, and she was sharing scripture with her with them and talking about like basically Jesus saying, I am the son of God. And they said, well, we don't use that verse. Well, of course you don't. You, you can't. I mean, because they don't believe that Jesus is the son of God. They don't believe, right? And 
They believe he is a son of God, like, you know, but they don't believe he is the son. They don't believe he's God. They don't believe in the Trinity. They don't believe in those things. They think he's, there's a lot of different things that they think. Yeah, and, and it's changed throughout the years, by the way. Um, yeah, there's, we're, yeah, we're not going to get into the Jehovah Witness beliefs tonight, but but I want to tell you that, uh, listen, if you are a Jehovah Witness, God loves you. He wants you to know the true Messiah. The true Messiah is Jesus Christ. He is God, and he's very clearly stating this right here in the Gospel of John. I hope for you. I love you, and Man, I, I actually like talk. I, I've talked to many Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses through the years, but they, for some reason, ha, don't come around my house much because they, they come once, they don't come again. I don't know why. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, and, P, and, one, and one of the things we have to be careful is picking and choosing. We've got to be careful. We've got to make sure we go through the whole gospel because that's what other religions and other the cults, that's what they believe. They pick and choose, and they choose what they want, and that they start a whole belief. Like, guys, there, you, you know, I tell people this, and people think I'm crazy, but in West Virginia and Kentucky, there's a whole bunch of churches that they play with poisonous snakes during their services because they believe— that when Paul was bit by the asp and nothing happened, a poisonous snake, and nothing happened to him, they believe that if you have enough faith, you should be able to do that. Guys, that, that is not what that scripture is meant for. That is not what he tells us to do, right? Moses, or Jesus also walked on water, but I, I've kept trying, and it's not working. It's just not happening. I'm not... Anyways, um, I started when I was a baby in the bathtub. No, anyways. All right, so one of the things we got to realize is that the Word of God, the whole counsel of the Word of God is so, so important, all right? Let's go back to the Gospel of John chapter 10. He says in verse 37, if, 37, if I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. So how do we, let me ask you this question to you guys real quick. We don't have a ton of time. My brother's calling me. Thad, I'm teaching, all right? He's not listening to me online. He normally listens. But um, the one thing I want to encourage you is, is, so you look at this when it says, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Again, I am statement, I am in the Father. What, what is the evidence as you guys see in teaching and people's lives? What are some things that are evidence of God in their lives? Okay. People's language change now. Just because you cuss doesn't mean you're not a Christian, but it does. It right, but it it is evidence if it's not happening and it did happen before. Absolutely, I would agree with that. Right. Lifestyle changes. Yep. Uh, uh, Beth, who was who was uh, baptized on Sunday, she said. When God came into her life over a year ago, she just doesn't really seem like she wants to drink anymore. She doesn't even know why, even though she drank all the way till she was 50 years old. She just doesn't see a need for it anymore. She, no one told her she wasn't supposed to. She just, she just didn't need it anymore, right? So there's lifestyle changes. Okay, what else? Gosh, the first thing I look at is how they handle money. How they handle money. Yep. That's, that's odd coming from you, Paul. No, but yes, how they handle money. I agree with you totally. It is. Yeah, I agree. I'm not being condemning. No, and, but it, that's something that I think some Christians will learn. But I'm going to tell you, some Christians learn that right off the bat because they want to give to what God's doing. It's out of the abundance of the heart is what the Bible says, right? You can't. Malachi literally tells you to test him. I mean, come on. When God says test him, do it. Let's check it out. Let's see what happens, right? No, that's not why you do it. But man, I'll tell you, it's the only place because he wants us to trust him, right? Did someone, do you have a hand raised? Yeah. It's going to the fruit of the spirit, right? It's, it's characteristics of the Holy Spirit in you. It's, it's not just something natural that happens in you. It's it's, there's something different, right? And that right there, guys, I want to tell you, is not natural. Go ahead. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah, that's that's good. Yeah. Yeah. So talking, it's it, I'm not gonna be able to share all of that. And sorry, it was really good. You should be here if you want to hear it. But what we're talking about, Laurel was talking about the understanding of there are good people out there. Just because you're not a Christian doesn't mean you don't do good things. Doesn't mean you're not a good person or raise good kids. But the difference is, is a Christian knows when they're done wrong and they're at, they want forgiveness. They're seeking forgiveness. They, they desire to be forgiven. And it, there's a, a vulnerability almost, right, in a heart of a Christian to know. Like I've said in the last couple of weeks, my favorite statement in the last like month or so is, the older I get, the less I sin, but the more I repent. It's realizing that I am, it's not about me, it's about him. It's how much I need God. And I do think that is a very strong evidence because, again, there are good people out there, right? I mean, there are people that are, you know, not all, you know, cracked out and, and on cocaine. Not everyone that's not a Christian is, is doing crazy stuff, right? They're living their life. They're trying to do good. And being a good person doesn't make you a Christian, right? But as a Christian, the good works actually, like James says, faith without works is dead. The good works are going to come out of me, but it's a different mindset. It's not because I want to be good. It's just because it's because I live for my God. I live for my Lord and it's out of the love and the abundance of Christ in me that the good stuff comes out of me. And you realize it has nothing to do with me, but everything to do with him. Have you guys ever done something so good and you're like, wow, that had nothing to do with me, right? I can't tell you how many times that happened in my life. How many times I've said things like someone came at me and said, you know, asked a question and it's just like, Pleh. I'm like, I've never heard those things or ever saw those things. I don't even know where that came out of, right? And, and it was like, that person was like, That's just, it was like the Lord is speaking right to me. I'm like, no, it was, because it wasn't me. I don't know what that, you know, right? God does those things. And, and that, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, that's, that's really good. What else? Really quick. And we're going to try to finish up chapter 10. What's that? Love of the word. Love of the word of God. Wanting the word of God. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, that's good. Yeah, people do act weird around you. They act different, right? You become a conviction to people and you don't even try. It's like, listen, I, I, never, want, I never once at West Virginia University stood up in front of the football team and said, okay, when I'm around, no dirty jokes or no cussing. Never said that. But every time I'm around, everyone's language changes. I mean, they had to, when I would come through the locker room, they would scream it, you know? Chaplain's here! You know, it's like, what? what? Guys, like, come on. I always laugh. There was this one lady. I, I think I've shared this before, but there was this one lady. She was the sweet. I, I love this woman. She was one of the cooks. I just loved her so much. She was so much fun. But she said, it, ne it never failed. Whenever I came around the corner, she was telling a dirty joke. She said, and just, I don't know what it is about you, but every time I'm sharing what, I just got to stop telling my jokes. I'm like, maybe, I don't know. Start telling better jokes, <laughs> you know, but it's just funny. It's like, I, you don't even try, right? It's the conviction. And I would, I would say that is a, that is a, an evidence of, of the, of the word in you. And listen, people will see it in you. You don't have to try to convince people you're a Christian. I never once have to say, nope, I don't do that. I'm a pastor. No. In fact, I try not to tell people I'm a pastor, right? Because I hope that they see it in my life, not in my title. You get it? That's the evidence of God in us. Lover of the word. I want to tell you another thing. I know for a long time I talked about this. And yes, Zach's first time back. I'm going to bring it up. But I haven't brought it up in a long time. But the Iranian church, <laughs> the Iranian church the, I, the one thing that's so evident of the, of the Christians in Iran, they're falling in love with the Jews. Iranians, Christians, falling in love with Jewish people. That's got to be God. That's got to be God, right? Think about that. Like, 
that, again, you see the evidence, okay? Let's go back to the gospel of John chapter 10. Starting in verse 39, we're going to finish. I think we're going to get there. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. Again, another one of those ninja moves or whatever, however he did that, I still can't wait to find out how he got away from these guys because they're all trying to go after him. And he's like, nope, you can't touch this. Anyways, I know that's a bad song. But he went, verse 40, he went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first. And there he remained and many came to him. And they said, John did no sign, but even everything that John said about this man was true. And many believed in him there. And there again, evidence of the gospel. John was baptizing people, talked about Jesus, told what Jesus was. And these people were like, he goes back to the area where John was baptizing and they're watching Jesus. And this is years afterwards, by the way, years and years afterwards. Well, probably about three years afterwards. It's getting close. He's only, we're only three months away, by the way, according to scripture and timeline, we're only three months away from his crucifixion. Not three months in our time, three months in the Bible timeline, okay? It's going to take us a while to get there. But I want to tell you, what happens is they see Jesus, and his life showed it. His life showed it. I want to tell you, there's nothing better. Now, I'm still Josh Sonoga, the whiner little brother, the, the youngest. I'm still that. Ask my mom. Ask my brothers. I'm still me. But I love it when I can hear people say there's something different in you. And you know why? So I can say, yes, there is. And his name is Jesus Christ. When someone says that, and that, praise God, has happened many times in my life. And I'm going to tell you, I do everything I can to point it to Jesus because it really is not me. It really is. It's his word. It's his truth. It's, it's his spirit in me. And as I read the word and the spirit works in me, I can't, you guys have probably even seen a change in me in 10 months. You guys get to see me all the time. I'm still loud and annoying, but may, hopefully you've seen a difference in, in, in me because I don't want to be the same in a year from now. I don't want to be, and I don't want you to be either. And if you are, guess what? I'm wasting my time and we're not doing our job. I want to challenge you. I want you to challenge me. We got to get out of our comfort zone and we got to do more. Not got to, not because Jesus needs us. He doesn't need us. He can use that pew if he wants to, but guess what? He wants to use us. And yeah, we had 146 people in church on on Sunday, but I, you know, that's great. But I want to see 146 on fire believers coming to Jesus Christ, changing lives. We baptized three people on Sunday, which is great. It's awesome. But I want to see them walking in Jesus now and discipling them and helping them move forward, not just helping them sit there and go, praise God, you got baptized. Great. It's not over. It's just the beginning, right? And that's the idea. And they saw it. Everything John said about you is true. You know, the best part is, is everything the Old Testament said about you is true too. And that's why it's crazy that the religious leaders didn't see it. His word is so awesome, guys. I love it. Well, we're coming to an end here. We got a few minutes. I want to, I want to thank you guys. You guys have been, all been pretty faithful on, uh, on Wednesday nights and it really was an encouragement that, uh, that I was given by Deb to, to do this. And, uh, and it's been an encouragement to me. I hope it has been to you guys. I want to, I want this place filled, but you know what? You guys are good enough, you know, seriously. Cause, cause I want to tell you, you're welcome. Cause I, you don't even know how much fun I, I, I hope you guys can tell I have fun doing this. If you can't, then you guys are not watching me because I get fired up. Like when I get to do this, like seriously, it is, it is so much what I love to do. And like today, I hid downstairs. Kendra is only here till noon on, on uh, Wednesdays. And, and I went to lunch. I came back and she was gone. So I hid down in her office in the corner and I just, I just got into this stuff. And I was, I was finding myself in Isaiah and finding myself in Revelation. I'm like, I got to focus. It's just, it's so much fun to allow the word to just speak to you and, and let, it, let it continue to come out through, through what he's trying to tell us. And guys, I want to tell you, as you do that, you will see a difference. And, and I want to tell you all the things you guys have said, right? It's the love of other people, I think, too, that is going to come out of us, okay? And the love of other people that we normally wouldn't love. Make sense? It's, not, it's easy to love people that are like me, that, that I get along with. 
But man, when I start loving people that I don't get along with, that's Jesus Christ. That's God. That's not me. Because I'd never choose to love people I don't really normally like. Right? And that's, that's what's so cool and so amazing that God wants to do in our lives. And you know what? One of the things I want to encourage you today is, and those of you online, stop coming to Jesus for something in return and start realizing that he is the living God and, want, and because you come to him just because he died on a cross for your sins, because he gave you an opportunity to have everlasting life. Is that not enough? We come to Jesus, a lot of times we come to church because we want, now listen, we should get something out of church. I'm not saying we shouldn't. We should, and we better. And that's got to happen, right? But don't have the heart. Well, if that place, I tell you what, I, I better get something out of that place. Well, you know what? You better give something in that place because that's why you're here. You're not here in this place to be a consumer. It is not a consumer sport. Christianity is not about your consumerism. It's not about your entertainment. It's not about your feel-good stuff. In fact, if you walk away every Sunday feeling good, you're probably, we're not, probably not teaching you the Bible right. It's that simple, right? How did, the, how did the religious leaders feel after they walked away from Jesus? Well, let me think. They tried to kill him. They weren't feeling too good. Why? Because they were convicted by the Holy Spirit. And guys, I hope that I am convicted every time I read the Word of God. I am, especially when I get into it like I do for Wednesday nights and I get into it to study. I get convicted. I want to let the Holy Spirit flow, and I want to grow, and I want to be more like him. So anyways, good stuff. It's 8.01. You guys talked a lot again. Sorry. No. Uh, yes, you can go ahead and go on up. Mary, thank you so much. Um, so again, next week is prayer, so we won't be doing Bible study, but please come and pray the congregation. The following week, we're going to have a, a stand-in teacher because I'm going to be on vacation with my family in Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, enjoying our time together. Um, but we're going we're gonna to continue. Uh, we'll be in chapter 11 next time of the Gospel of John. I encourage you to read ahead. All right? Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this time. I thank you for your love, your mercy, your grace, your word, for everything that you are, Lord Jesus. You are the good shepherd and Lord, you literally tell us that there's nothing that can snatch us out of your hands if we truly know you as our Lord and Savior. And Lord, for that, I am thankful. And if there's anyone listening that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, that today would be the day of salvation. They would take the ABCs of salvation and they would take it seriously, Lord. They would admit that they're sinners. They would believe that you are God, that you died on a cross for our sins through the cross, through the resurrection. Lord, you rose again to conquer death and to give us life. And lastly, the C is that you commit your life to God. And I pray, Lord, that it happens to someone today through this video, uh, through this word, and through your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good stuff.